Okay. Let me do this here. Yeah. Maybe I should take this one off. Uh, no, it doesn't work anymore. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for um, attending this wonderful summer school. And I would like to thank the organizers for having me here at this wonderful place here in Santander. Um, I would like to start out briefly by talking, uh, just saying a little bit about the Magnetic Society. I mean, no, most, of this, most of this you should already know because uh, you have been uh, applying for this. But the Magnetic Society is really a very nice society if you work in magnetism um, and if you want to make this uh, your, your profession in the future. Uh, we have about 3,000 full members. <clears throat> 300 of them are students. And really what the society tries to do and where they really like put a lot of effort on is uh, on conference organization and student support to, for, uh, to make it possible that students can support, uh, these conferences, uh, attend these conferences. And they do the distinguished lectureship, which uh, means they have three or four people every year that they send around the world uh, and give uh, lectures about their work. And that's what I'm doing this year. And um, no? Ah, there it is. And um, the title of my talk is Ultra Fast and Very Small. And so what I would like to do within the next hour or so is to give you a little bit of an idea what you can do with soft x-rays, in particular with soft x-ray microscopy at a synchrotron to learn about magnetism. And <clears throat> so I am from uh, SLAC, National Accelerator Laboratory. In particular, the, the, the SLAC has a light source, a synchrotron light source, SSL over here. And this light source is located very closely, uh, in the, uh, it's, it's in Stanford very closely to the Silicon Valley. So traditionally, our group has interacted a lot with uh, the hard drive industry and so on. And we have heard a lot about this this morning already, already in uh, Bernard Denis' talk uh, about GMR and any kind of sensors. So this is something where we are also very interested in, in all of these uh, materials and that you can use for, for these device applications and how to study them with soft x-rays. And in particular, then, how to look at it at the nanoscale and using the synchrotron as, a, as an X-ray strobe, uh, strobe light source uh, with picosecond time resolution. <clears throat> okay, so in my talk, what I will do is I will spend a little bit of time at the beginning to give you an introduction, really, what our motivation is, uh, why we think that this is something where you can uh, use X, why, you, why we think X-rays are something that you can use to learn more new information about these devices, and then <clears throat> talk a little bit about the technique itself and how, uh, how, you can, uh, how to use soft x-rays in a microscope uh, to learn something about magnetic uh, magnetism, magnetic domains, uh, distribution of magnetic moments and interfaces. Um, and then I will give you three examples, essentially, uh, of how we uh, applied this to three different examples um, in uh, three different interfaces, uh, interferomagnetic, ferromagnetic interfaces, uh, spin transfer across interfaces, or whoops, uh, a spin injection um, that is very closely related to GMR, what we heard about this morning, and then how you can use uh, the time resolution of the microscope to image spin waves. Okay. So, um, I want to start with something that, that came up uh, in one of the conferences that I went to this year, and we, we talked about this a little bit. Um, and if you work in magnetism, and I'm, I'm doing this now for about 25 years, Every couple of years, somebody will tell you magnetism is dead. So there's nothing new that you can learn about this. And um, so essentially when I started at the beginning of the 90s, uh, people said magnetism is very well understood. We understand, uh, we understand iron, cobalt, nickel. These are the magnetic materials. There's nothing new to learn. <clears throat> and then people started doing surface magnetism because um, there were now um, commercially available UHV apparatuses so that you could actually um, pre prepare very thin film and stu study magnetism in thin films and surfaces. And then this one was, un was very well understood. <clears throat> and so, but every time somebody came up with a new idea and took it a step further and further and further. And so one of the driving forces really behind what's going on for the last 10 years is, as we learned this morning, uh, the Nobel Prize in 2008 and the, the, result, uh, the uh, work in, in 1988 by uh, Ferd and Greenberg that led to this really new development of hard drive technology, in particular the read heads, the GR-based read heads. And so one particular thing is that if you're ever, if you ever at, a, at a dinner party and you don't know what to say and you want to start a conversation with your friends, um, 
one of the very fascinating um, uh, details about a hard drive is really, if you have a hard drive and you, 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 would, you would scale the read head up to the size of a Boeing 747, it would actually be, uh, the disk would be the size roughly of the Earth, and uh, the 747 would at fly 800 times the speed of sound and would still be able to uh, register every blade of grass on the ground. So this is kind of, kind of amazing if you think about it. So the specifications that you really need, the accuracy that you need, the technology that goes into such a read head are, are just unbelievable. So if you tell an engineer that's what you need, the engineer will tell you it's not possible. If you, if you just write down the specifications, they, everybody will tell you it's not, just not possible. But it has grown into something over the years that, that, is, that, that is made possible, essentially. <clears throat> it's also quite interesting to note that uh, when you do such a read head, a magnetic read head, this multi-layered structure with like atomically flat interfaces, um, the first steps to produce this read head, between the first steps that it, uh, that it needs to produce this such a read head, and until the, the disk then leaves the factory, there are about six to nine months in between. Um, and again, there's science based on a Nobel Prize behind it. Um, amazingly enough, the costs for a one terabyte hard drive are pretty much the same of a toaster. So, I mean, if you buy it in, in the store. And uh, so you can imagine there are vastly different pr uh, profit margins between these two, uh, these two things here. Um, but then also, you actually you sell much, many more hard drives than toasters worldwide. <clears throat> it's still, but still interesting to note that um, some people may say every, every hard drive nowadays has a, a solid, uh, solid storage <clears throat> device in there. Um, but uh, the, the big thing here is really cloud computing. And uh, the, as we learned this morning, the costs of a hard drive are just unbeatable still. So every cloud that you have, you have like huge uh, hard drive farms behind it. And um, so that's really what's, what's, driving what's driving it. And one could probably say uh, that, and it depends on who you ask, but about 50 to 100% of the economy somehow depends, or de depends on a hard drive. And the same is true for a laser. I mean, the laser is behind uh, essentially every internet connection. You have, electro -optic, uh, you have optic coupler in there. In there. Um, so it's, it's kind of, it's still, a, it's still an industry that's driving. Uh, and where, so there's a lot of, lot of interest still, and there's a lot to go still. OK, and so <clears throat> um, where we come in is, is uh, when we think about how we do we engineer hard drives nowadays. So on the left-hand side is a. It's a picture of the first hard drive that was ever sold by IBM, the 1956 IBM Ramac. It's a five megabyte hard drive. It's about a ton that it weighs, and you could lease it for $30,000 a month. 60 years later, the capacity and the density and the cost efficiency has increased dramatically, uh, the density by about 10 to the 9. And now you have five terabyte and like half a pound. Really going from there to there has, there's a completely different approach to engineering. Uh, over here, it's really like it's mechanical engineering. You have to shape things on macroscopic lens scales. While here, on this side, uh, you really have to engineer your materials on fundamental lens scales. And that's, that's the big uh, selling point here. That's the big issue. You have to engineer something on fundamental on atomic lens scales. So you do multilayers. You, do, you design, you design uh, alloys, et cetera, um, where, where you then, once you, once you scale everything down, you have to change the properties and you have to change them on an atomic lens scale. To do this, you also need new characterization tools, and that's exactly where X-rays come in. X-rays, because of their very short wavelengths, they can't uh, probe uh, materials on these very short uh, distances, on atomic distances, and they can also um, see through materials, so they can penetrate the material and can look at different layers in a multi-layered sample. <clears throat> Black. Okay, that's there. There we are. Um, so, as I so as I said, um, uh, the, the technology has evolved quite a bit over the last sixty years, and it has actually uh, uh, improved dramatically over the last sixty years. And and we saw part of this this morning already. If you look at Moore's law on on, magneto, on, on magnetic storage. Uh, somewhere in the 1960, it started with the first hard drive and, and has co constantly improved over the decades. At the same time, and as I said, we, we, we suggest or we want to use X-rays 
to, uh, to study these materials. So the, the smaller you make the materials, the, the smaller you make the units, the bits, and so on, the more uh, the, high, the, the brighter light sources you need to really learn something about something on the nanoscale. And at the same time, the intensity of light sources, available light source, has increased quite dramatically as well. From the very first X-ray tubes, uh, and this is actually this is the intensity on a logarithmic scale, uh, for, for, with the first generation synchrotron, the second, uh, different generations on synchrotron and free electron lasers today, actually the intensity has also improved by 20 orders of magnitude. And so the basic idea behind a synchrotron is, and I, I will talk a little bit more in detail later on uh, about this, is that you start with an electron gun, so you produce little packages of electrons, little pulses of electrons, you accelerate them in a linear accelerator, then you take them in, this, in the booster synchrotron where they get accelerated to uh, a couple of uh, giga electron volts and reach uh, relativistic speeds, and then they get injected into the storage ring where they circulate for hours and hours and hours. And every time they go around a corner, they will irradiate x-rays. So, and again, while the, the technology has evolved and got smaller and smaller and smaller, also the, the x-ray uh, source technology has evolved at, 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 and kept pace with, uh, with the, techno uh, with the um, storage densities. Slow here. Ah. Okay, and so <clears throat> just to summarize this a little bit, uh, or to, to illustrate this one more time, um, now when you, when you think about microscopy and you do, do microscopy on, on regular length scales between millimeters and micrometers, you can certainly use um, um, uh, optical microscopies, uh, optical microscopes which have typically a, a, a wavelength or a limit in resolution of about a micrometer. But if you really want to go into the nano world and the nanotechnology, then you hit actually the limit of optical wavelength because the optical wavelength limits your resolution that you can achieve in a microscope. <clears throat> so if you really want to use, uh, do something in the nano world, you have to shorten the wavelength of the light that you're using, and that's really where X-rays come in so that you are able to uh, 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 identify nanoparticles, etc. And also there are other advantages of, of X-ray microscopy, which I will uh, describe in a, in a second, and that's things like element specificity, the ability to measure uh, ferromagnets, antiferromagnets, etc. But again, uh, since everything also not, not only becomes smaller, but also faster, the other advantage of, of synchrotron microscopy is um, that you have... Um, a pulsed X-ray source, and these pulses are typically of the order of uh, a couple of tens of picoseconds. So and this is exactly where all these uh, effects, uh, the gigahertz of precessions and so on, that are in important for um, applications really, play, uh, really happening, like spin precession and damping, thermal activation, and so on and so on. If you go to much faster processes in the, in the femtosecond uh, range, then it's actually then you uh, really need to uh, go to fr uh, free electron lasers with much shorter um, um, uh, pulse lens. Okay, so to summarize this introduction, um, what we really have done over the last, uh, let's say, 120 years in X-ray microscopy or in X-ray imaging, what, was, what has happened is from the very first images that were obtained by Conrad Röntgen, um, that you just used a, 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 a X-ray um, uh, X-ray source to image the bones in, the hand, in, in his hand, or hand of his assistant actually, um, and to identify the different densities uh, in, in, the, in the hand. Um, it took about 100 years to take this from, from very simple topography or simple density measurements to surface magnetism in 1895, 1995, sorry, um, where uh, the first images of magnetic domains on a hard drive were achieved. And then about six years later, so on, we took this as a second generation synchrotron, now we get to the next generation of synchrotron, much higher intensity, which then allowed you to not only see something in two dimensions, but also in three dimensions, and I think I have to change it to this one here, um, but also in three dimensions, uh, so that you're able actually not to only see magnetic domains at the surface, but magnetic domains at the surface as well as in the bulk, from ferromagnet to an anti-ferromagnet, and also identify the coupling right at the interface. And then it took another 10 to 15 years to really then also add the time resolution to really now be able to image magnetization in four, domain, uh, four dimensions, X, Y, Z, and T, uh, and so then also get uh, images of magnetic uh, spin waves. Right. Now I'm actually... Okay, so this will be... Um, okay, good. So I, I apologize. Apparently my, my battery just died on, on, my, on my pointer. Um, so, what I will do in the next couple of biographs, then tell you a little bit about really how a synchrotron looks like, 
and uh, what, how we use it uh, to produce x-rays, and as well, what kind of different contrast mechanisms you can use um, in, in x-ray microscopy. And so I have this very nice picture here of, of uh, the synchrotron in, 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 in Stanford. And so these synchrotron centers usually were um, situated at, at large, uh, 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 large research facilities, like, for example, SLAC here in Stanford, or um, there was one in Argonne, in, in, in Daisy, in, in Hamburg, where you used to have um, uh, large accelerators that were dedicated at high-energy physics laboratories to really study uh, particle physics and so on. And at the very beginning, then, these uh, accelerator-based uh, labs um, then just uh, provided some, some means so that people could also use them for synchrotron science, but over the years, the, the accelerators have become bigger and bigger, and so the lab stayed behind and uh, uh, just focused more and more than on photon science. And nowadays, uh, SLAC is really not uh, a lab that is only dedicated to high energy physics. It's really, it's, it's, a, it's a multidisciplinary lab where uh, many people use the photons produced by these, uh, X -ray, uh, by these electron accelerators to study life sciences, applied physics, astrophysics, and chemistry. And so, again, the way this works is and it had been uh, discovered very early on in 1947 at General Electric. If you have a, an electron beam, uh, a small electron beam, and you bend it around in a magnet, what happens is uh, you have an accelerated charge, and that accelerated charge will emit radiation. If you now, and that the radiation, uh, the energy of the radiation depends on the magnetic field strength and the energy of the electrons. <coughs> the energy of the electrons is very high in a synchrotron. It's almost relativistic, so they are almost with the speed of light. And so that means the energy of the, of, the X -ray, of the radiation that gets emitted is also very high. And so typically uh, for like uh, half a uh, MeV, uh, any, um, uh, half an MeV, no, sorry, for one, one and a half GeV, the photon energy that you can achieve is up to one kilo electron volts, and that, that shifts to much, much higher energy over uh, the higher you get the electron energy. And typically, so many synchrotrons nowadays operate between two to four GeV, that taught two to five GeV, so you can easily achieve energies all the way up to 10 keV uh, photon energy. So, however, in our case, what we do is we mostly focus on the low energy range. So we focus on what we call soft X-rays. And so soft X-rays are energies, uh, are X-rays with an energy up to one keV or a wavelength up to one nanometer. While hard X-rays typically would be considered anything with, that has a, has a wavelength of a couple of angstroms. And if you have a wavelength of a couple of angstroms, then you can really do uh, crystallography, uh, diffraction on a crystal. So you can really learn something about distances. So that means if you do your uh, diffraction in the lab, very often what you see is you get a pattern and so you know where the atoms are. In our case, the wavelength is way too long, so we don't really know, learn anything about uh, atomic distances, but we learn something about electronic structure, because the energy that we are using, these 500, or 500 to 1,000 uh, electron volts, really matches very well with interatomic uh, um, excitations. And so, <clears throat> typically what happens is now you use a soft x-ray, uh, for example, here for iron, uh, that's the iron uh, L edge, uh, iron L resonance, <clears throat> So you come in with 710 EV X-rays, and then you excite an, uh, a core-level electron, so that's a 2P level, uh, up to a 3D final state, so this is, this is the vacuum, the, fer uh, the Fermi edge here, and so it, once you have, uh, above the Fermi edge, you have unoccupied states, and so you have, essentially, this transition, uh, this transition only occurs if you match the photon energy right to this energy difference. <clears throat> So um, this is essentially, this is the, and so you, you describe this with Fermi's golden rule uh, in, in quantum mechanics, and so this Fermi golden rule has two uh, uh, components, the matrix uh, operator and the density of valence states. <clears throat> and so um, uh, uh, the mate, this, this operator really uh, vanishes every time you come on with a photon energy that, that's not matching here. Um, that's not matching this energy difference. And then you also get a very nice, uh, to the density of valence states, you get a very nice probe of really how these valence states up here look like. So what you do is essentially, you, ex you use the, f uh, the, the incoming X-ray to produce a photoelectron, and that photoelectron uh, uh, probes your valence uh, electrons up here. Because these valence electrons very, uh, depend very strongly on, on, on um, on, on uh, uh, chemical bonding, etc. So, and you can see this very nicely now. If you scan the photon energy, for example, you have a sample that has iron, cobalt, or nickel. 
uh, and you scan your photon energy from 700 to around 900 eV, every time you, you meet these conditions, these uh, resonance conditions, you will see an absorption peak. So that's the iron L3, iron L2, L3, an electron excited from here, L2, electron excited from there, iron, cobalt, nickel, and they all appear at very distinct energies because you typically have an energy resolution of about a tenth of an eV. So you can very nicely see these peaks. <clears throat> so that gives you the elemental specificity. But also, since the, the density of states up here, they depend very sensitively on what the environment, whether this iron atom sits is surrounded by iron atom or the iron atom is surrounded by oxygen atom, the 3D electrons up here will, will notice that, they will feel that, and so uh, you will have a very different uh, uh, distribution here. And so the spectra changes significantly, and you can then tell whether you have iron or iron oxide, cobalt or cobalt oxide, or nickel or nickel oxide. So that gives you the chemical sensitivity. <clears throat> And then you can use this actually in a microscope. And so there are different types of microscope. Um, on the left-hand side, we have photon in, so-called photon in, photon out microscopes. And on the right-hand side, there's a photon in, electron out microscope. <clears throat> so on the left-hand side, um, these microscopes use uh, X-ray optics to make a very small uh, spot of X-rays on your samples. And then you have an X-ray detector behind the sample that uh, measures the transmitted X-rays. So and that gives you essentially a measure of how many X-rays get absorbed in your sample. And the difference between the, the scanning transmission X-ray microscope, or STIXM, and the transmission X-ray microscope, or TIXM, is the following. In the TIXM, actually, the optical setup is very much like a regular microscope, uh, optical microscope in the lab. So you have two lenses, and you put uh, your sample at an appropriate uh, distance between these two lenses, depending on the focal length of these two lenses. And then you have a camera in the back to take an image. So you get a full field image. I and mean, that's a very nice technique to get down to 10, 15 nanometer uh, spatial resolution. In the STIXIM, you only have one lens, and you make a very small focus. And now you scan the sample through your focus, and you just have a very simple detector, a one-dimensional detector like a photodiode. So by doing so, um, then you, you, uh, you have to scan your sample, and that uh, requires a little bit of stability in your whole setup, but then you scan your sample, but you have a very simple detector that is also easy then to use for time-resolved measurements because you can actually have a very fast detector here that your camera is typically is not. <clears throat> in the PEAM, you don't need any optics for the, for the X-rays because you just illuminate your entire sample, and then uh, X-rays get ab absorbed in the sample, and in areas where you have more X-rays absorbed, you produce more electrons, photoelectrons, or more secondary electrons, and now you just have electrostatic lenses, and you image, you produce a magnified image of the, of the electron yield of your sample onto a screen in the back. The difference is here, here you can really look through your entire sample. Samples can be as thick as a couple hundred nanometers up to a micron in the, in the X in transmission X-ray microscopy. Why here you're very surface sensitive because your photoelectrons really only come from the first couple of nanometers. And so you can then use these to, as I said, to get the elemental and the chemical uh, contrast, but you can also use it to get magnetic contrast. And this is now what, uh, this comes in via the, the polarization of your X-rays. So not only do you have a, have, a, have a source that has a very wide energy distance, so that you can pick and choose the photon energy that you would like to use. You can also pick and choose the polarization of the X-rays. And so <clears throat> you can, for example, choose between circular polarization and linear polarization. For the case of circular polarization, you become sensitive to the ferromagnetic moment in your sample. So let's say you, you have used circular polarization and you have an area of your sample where the magnetization is parallel to the circular polarization. That will actually increase the absorption yield while if it's anti-parallel, it will decrease the absorption. And so you've got this 180-degree uh, symmetry here. So that means now if you take an image of your sample, and typically what you would do is you get an image at this energy, get an image at this energy, you divide these two uh, pictures by each other, and so you get a purely magnetic contrast, and now you see magnetic domains pointing up, down, left, and right, and this field of view here is about 5 by 5 micrometers. <clears throat> now, for ferromagnetism, there are other techniques available, and smoke microscopy and other things that you can do uh, very nicely in your lab to uh, get image of ferromagnetic domains. What's a little bit, and, and these, all these uh, techniques make use of the fact that you actually have a magnetic moment in your sample that you, that you can have, use to interact with the, with the light that's coming in. It gets a little bit more difficult, difficult if you want to uh, image antiferromagnets, because antiferromagnets do not have a net magnetic moment. 
uh, but they still have typically a, 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 a preferred axis along which these two moments align. For example, here you may have an area where you only have spins up and down, and here you have an area where you only have spins left or right. And then you use this actually to, um, to image antiferromagnetic domains, for example, on nickel oxide, which is an antiferromagnet. You come in with linear polarization, and if the polarization is parallel to the, uh, uh, to the spin axis, you measure a certain absorption spectrum, and if it's perpendicular, the, 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 there are again there are two peaks in the absorption spectrum, two or three peaks, depending on the material, where this relative intensity changes. In nickel oxide, this is very well characterized, and you can get a very nice image of antiferromagnetic domains of your sample. Okay, so that means we now have elemental, chemical, and magnetic contrast. The last thing that comes is the time resolution. And as I said at the beginning, um, it's, you start with, an, with a little electron bunches that uh, come in at about, they're typically about 50 picoseconds long, and they are, they, they are separated often by a couple of nanoseconds. In our case, it's about two nanoseconds. <clears throat> so you don't have a continuous X-ray beam coming, uh, 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 shining on your, on your sample. You have this pulsed X-ray source. But now you can do, actually use this to, like, like in a stroboscope, to learn something about your sample, um, how, it, how it behaves in time and how, how the dynamic behavior of your sample. And what you would really do is now you need, you need to have some sort of detector so that you can uh, detect every, um, um, every X-ray pulse independently and then also provide an excitation to your sample, like a current pulse, a field pulse, an electric field uh, pulse, whatever, that is then synchronized uh, with this, with this uh, um, X-ray pulse. So again, so you have like, essentially, uh, there are certain gaps in this pattern, but you have a 50 picosecond bunch coming every two nanoseconds at your sample. And then on the, other hand, on the other hand, you have some sort of excitation that you can synchronize with respect to that. And the next view graph, this is a little bit busy, and I, I, you don't need to, I don't want to go through every detail here, but this is exactly, this, this explains a little bit of how we are doing this. <clears throat> So it's, it's, an, it's an electronic that has been developed over the course of a couple of years uh, at SSL and, and the advanced light source. Um, again, so this is the X-ray, so that's the synchrotron. This represents the synchrotron with the X-ray pulses that are generated. Now these X-ray pulses, or uh, electron pulses, bunches, produce X-ray pulses that are focused towards the sample with a the, with the zone plate. And now here we have a sample, we transmit through the sample, and we have our diode in the back. And the most important thing here is to, to, uh, to remember this diode is not a regular diode, it's an avalanche photodiode, and that avalanche photodiode is, um, has the advantage that it's able to, uh, first of all, attend in, um, your single, so because after, after all these steps uh, and going through all the optics, on average, per pulse, you only have, you have less than one photon here on your detector. So you need to detect every single photon that's going, coming through your sample every 50 picoseconds, and because the one photon is actually a very small signal, so you need to provide some gain and, and, and uh, amplify this right on the diode, and that's exactly what an avalanche photodiode does. And now we have a count, counting electronics that is able to register every, uh, every X-ray pulse, how it's coming through the sample, and put it into a particular counter. And it's, the nice thing about it is even, it's even, uh, uh, it's, um, even a little bit more uh, sophisticated, you can distinguish whether that X-ray pulse comes from bucket, bucket number one on the first or the second turn, also on even or odd cycles of the synchrotron. And this will become important later on because what we will do a lot is we will apply an excitation to our sample, like a current through a spin-talked uh, oscillator or a current through a, a polarized interface for one cycle of the synchrotron for about 800 nanoseconds and we register every, every pulse that's coming through, and then we do it for the, next, uh, for the next cycle of the synchrotron, we will remove this excitation. And we do this over and over again every 800 nanoseconds. And what this essentially is, is it's, it's a lock-in technique. It's a lock-in approach. Um, it's a lock-in approach where you lock, first of all, to the 50 picosecond, or the uh, to the 2.1 nanosecond, sorry, uh, uh, which is 476 megahertz, and also to the uh, revelation frequency of the synchrotron, which is 1.2 megahertz. And so by, by locking to these, you achieve very high sensitivity. And I'm saying this because in many of these applications that we are looking at, we are looking at very small changes of the magnetization. And if you have very small changes of the magnetization, you need to be able to normalize very well, really, what happens with your excitation compared to no excitation. And that's exactly the, the, the idea behind this, behind this scheme. Um, 
that you use this, this double lock, double lock in, uh, scheme to really drive the sensitivity, the magnetic sensitivity to see, see very small changes of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, six even with only a few seconds of exposure time. Okay, and so just uh, a few pictures of the microscope to get, get in roughly an idea. Uh, everything fits kind of in two hands, more or less. So the distance from here to here, so the, or I should say the focal distance is three millimeters, so that gives you a little bit of an idea how big this all is. This is the zone plate holder. The zone plate is here at the end. There's an aperture in between the sample holder and the avalanche photodiode. And so the nice thing about um, doing photon in, photon out measurements is that you can put everything into, uh, into a magnetic field. So because the, the photons do not feel the magnetic field that you apply, so we have different uh, electromagnets that can uh, provide about a quarter Tesla <coughs> uh, in this direction, or we have a permanent magnet that can apply about 0.8 Tesla in that direction uh, for the different kind of experiments. Okay, so... And uh, so that brings me to a, to, my, to a couple of examples, and the first one is, will be a brief example. Um, and essentially what I will do in these three examples, I will take you to a spin valve structure like you have seen them this morning, interface by interface. So uh, in the spin valve structure, what you, you have the, the ferromagnet, non-magnet, ferromagnet, uh, a tri-layer as discussed this morning that shows the GMR, and then the bottom layer is, is pinned to an anti-ferromagnet underneath here, to, uh, to define the, the, the reference direction. And so <clears throat> what really happens at this interface is um, if you have a regular ferromagnet and you apply a magnetic field or you cycle the magnetic field, you will see a hysteresis loop like shown here. Um, and this, uh, this hysteresis loop is typically symmetric with uh, uh, respect to the, uh, to, the, to the zero field and zero magnetization. However, once you put this ferromagnet on top of an antiferromagnet, you can introduce an effect referred to as exchange bias, and that effect, uh, in the best case scenario, really moves the, shifts the entire hysteresis loop along the field axis into one direction. And then the, what you, the, 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 the advantage here is that whatever you do to this ferromagnet, whatever field uh, uh, history it has seen, it will always come back to the same direction. So it, it will, if you apply just a large enough field, it will reverse, but once you reverse the field, re remove the field, it will come, down to, come back to the same magnetization. And that's what makes it very suitable as a magnetic reference layers, layer in these GMR devices. The idea is, to, if you want to understand how, what, where exchange bias comes about, is you really need to, um, uh, 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 um, oh, if you want to understand where exchange, how exchange bias comes about, the first assumption is always that you think that of the antiferromagnet as something that does not, is not affected by the ferromagnet, that does not see external field because it has as many spins in that direction as spins in that direction. So it really it doesn't care whether you apply a field in this way or this way or whatever the, the ferromagnet does. <clears throat> and that is, uh, that is something that we uh, addressed very early on using P microscopy if, if this is really the case. So we started with nickel oxide. Nickel oxide is a very nice guinea pig for antiferromagnetism. You can buy single crystals, and you can just uh, cleave the surface, the 100 surface, and you will see a, a zoo of magnetic domains. These, although it's a zoo of magnetic domains, they're actually fairly uh, clearly defined. Um, the nickel oxide crystal, and this tries, this, this tries to illustrate this, nickel oxide has the same crystal structure as sodium chloride. So it's a very simple uh, cubic structure. Um, and so what happens is actually if you, if you uh, in, in sodium chloride, you have four, or in this structure, you have four 111 pl uh, planes. And what happens when the antiferromagnet orders is that the, that the crystal contracts along one of these 111 planes. So either this plane, this plane, this plane, or this plane. And then the, the moments will order within this 111 plane. So, and these are referred to as twin domains, and within each twin domain, you can have different spin domains. And this is what we see here. You essentially, you have 12 different domains, and a subset of these 12 different domains you can see here on the left-hand side. <clears throat> and this is now imaged using PEAM, using linear polarization at the nickel absorption edge. Now, the funny thing is if you go to oxygen, the oxygen does not carry a magnetic moment, so it will not show magnetic linear dichroism. However, um, the oxygen will still feel this deviation from the perfect cubic symmetry because now the coordination of this, uh, of this oxygen is a little bit different whether it looks along the 111 plane or perpendicular to the 111 plane. 
And so you will actually also see a linear dichroism, but this linear dichroism has no magnetic origin. It's, it's really just crystal, crystallography. And it will show exactly nicely these four different twin domains. So in these four different twin domains, they have, need to have domain walls uh, that's determined by crystallography along high symmetry directions. So that's actually something very nice that we found out at the very beginning, that you can use uh, X-ray microscopy not only uh, in the polarization-dependent X-ray microscopy, not only to learn something about antiferromagnetism and ferromagnetism, but also something about crystallographic order. And that becomes very important if you really do magnetic oxides, et cetera. <coughs> so however, what, what, what we realized then after um, we put cobalt on top of nickel oxide is that the magnetic structure nickel oxide is not unchanged. It, is, it, is, it, it will be affected by the, by the uh, ferromagnetic layer on top. So when you start out, and you, now we zoom in much, we only have like, this, the scale bars at about two micrometers, so we're looking at the intersection of these four different uh, crystallographic twin domains, and, and here in this case, this is all uh, one uh, uh, antiferromagnetic domain. Once you put the cobalt on top of it, first of all, you observe that there's a parallel coupling between these two layers, so you have a antiferromagnetic axis over here that's parallel to the ferromagnetic domains that are right and left, and the antiferromagnetic axis over here, up and down, is parallel to the ferromagnetic up axis up and down over here. But these domain walls here went away, so you, instead of having four domains, you only have two domains. And to understand this is actually what really what happens in this case is that <clears throat> Due to this exchange coupling, if you think about where the antiferromagnetic axis was before in these four different crystallographic domains, they were kind of pointing into these directions that, uh, 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 along the, 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 the direction which um, splits this angle over here. And so the, the, the yellow and the blue domain have slightly different angles uh, with respect to the surface. One shows like this, one shows like this, and on the other side, it's just the other way around. But once they couple to the, once they couple to the ferromagnet, the domains, will be, the domains will be rotating into the surface plane, into the 100 plane, and uh, will be forced into that direction by, uh, via the parallel coupling. And so that actually leaves only two domains over, uh, uh, standing. And that was, uh, that was something that was very in, in, interesting, and um, I, I think there was a time at the, uh, about 10, 10, 12 years ago, where many different groups uh, did uh, imaging on, on antiferromagnets, and where people really learned something new about these domain, uh, systems because you couldn't, uh, regular uh, optical microscopy in the lab wouldn't tell you anything about this, and so this is really where, where X-ray microscopy has, has uh, uh, contributed quite a bit. So, and this brings me now to my second interface, uh, and that's the interface between the ferromagnet and the non-magnet. And that is exactly going back to the question that was discussed this morning, or the, the subject that was discussed this morning about uh, giant magneto-resistant and spin injection from a ferromagnet into a non-magnet. Um, and you have seen something very similar this morning, so I'm going to go over it briefly. Um, if you think about, uh, if you have uh, two ferromagnets separated by a non-magnetic layer, <clears throat> uh, and you measure the resistance of, of these stacks, you will realize that if the two magnetizations are interparallel, uh, the resistance is much higher if, is, if they're parallel. And so it actually can drop quite a bit. But what's important also to realize is that this resistance change depends on the... Um, on the uh, thickness of the layer in between. <clears throat> so if you have a very thin layer, you have a very strong resistance change. If you have a very thin layer, you have a, very, uh, have a small uh, resistance change. So apparently, whatever happens between these two ferromagnets, uh, the copper is kind of uh, um, um, uh, uh, separating these two, uh, or the, the, the non-magnetic layer in between, in this case here, I, I chose copper, uh, will separate the, magnet, uh, the magnetization, the spin polarization in these two layers from each top of each other. And also, the interface between these two layers seem to play an important role. <clears throat> and so, this is something that when I joined the group in Stanford, that was essentially on our plate to do, and that was 1999, um, that was on our plate to do at, as one of the first experiments. We really wanted to see, can we see how, if you run a current from a ferromagnet into a non-magnet, how does it change the magnetization in the non-magnet? Uh, we had plenty of great ideas how to do this, um, none of them worked, and so this is why it took until 2015 uh, until we were finally able to see the magnetization in the copper. And one of the reasons is that the, actually the magnetization induced in copper through this current is very, very small. And so it also took quite a while until we um, were able to really get the same, uh, the, 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 the right sample structure. And so we, we, we collaborated with a group at NYU, Andy Kent's group at NYU, 
and also with uh, John Katine at Hitachi Global Storage Technologies. And so Endocan uh, grew this wonderful uh, multi-layers uh, on silicon uh, on our substrates uh, with a buffer layer and a, a bottom contact of ruthenium and so on and so on and so on, uh, and a top contact of gold. And so we needed, uh, we needed a gold and ruthenium bottom layer because typically you would use copper, but we really wanted to make sure that only the layer that is in contact with our ferromagnetic cobalt palladium here is made from copper. So, and then after uh, Andrew uh, grew this wonderful uh, multi-layers with atomically flat interfaces, um, we, uh, Jordan Katine took them and made little nanopillars on them. So, again, it's on a silicon wafer. You have, a, I have one contact where you can wire bond to, then the current runs to the bottom ruthenium, runs to the magnetic stack, and then in the top contact you can again wire bond to, and now you can run a current through this whole thing. And now we do exactly what I mentioned earlier. We will uh, focus our x-rays on this pillar. This pillar is 250 by 250 nanometer. It's actually a 250 nanometer round contact uh, when you look at it. And now we will actually change. We will run the current one direction, we will run the current the other direction, or we will just remove the current entirely and compare how the transmission at this, uh, of this, the x-ray transmission of this pillar changes at the copper absorption edge using circular polarization. And so you go, you, so again, x-rays coming through, copper absorption edge, so you, ch you, you probe the electronic structure at the copper absorption edge. You also probe, you use circular polarization, so you actually probe the magnetic moment of copper while you change the current in here. And so what you see is the following. <clears throat> so this is now an image of the, of the nanopillar. So this is the 250 nanometers. Uh, this is the silicon dioxide in which it is embedded. And so this is just the chemistry, this is just the, the topography. Um, when, you, when you take two images with, uh, with opposite current or so, you will not see really a difference with your eyes. However, if you do a line scan through these different images, what you see is that for one uh, polarization of the x-rays, you see a slight increase in transmission, while for the other polarization of the x-rays, you see a slight decrease in the position. And this will actually also switch, switch sign when you go from plus 5 milliamp to minus 5 milliamp. And that's exactly what an XMCD is. So an XMCD, again, is a dependence on the, on the transmission on the, on the direction of the polarization or on the direction of the magnetic moment in this case. But if you look at the, at the, at the y-axis, you can see why it took us so long to really see this. The change in transmission is, is tiny. It's about five times 10 to the minus five. And that pretty much corresponds also to the magnetic moment that is induced into the, into the copper, uh, uh, copper layer. So the magnetic moment in, in copper due to spin transfer from cobalt is about five times 10 to the minus five. So it's a really, really small uh, moment. A small side note is if you don't, if you don't use cobalt but use iron, uh, the sign will actually change. And the reason for that is because in, in cobalt and copper, uh, cobalt and iron, and one of the materials has majority uh, spins at the, at the Fermi edge and the other one has minority spins at the Fermi edge. So that's actually kind of a nice consistency check. <clears throat> So what we did next is now, we were quite happy that we could see this. Um, oops. We were quite happy that we could see this, um, but we wanted to know a little bit more about this signal and how, this, how the XMCD depends on the photon energy. So here on the right-hand side, there are a couple of uh, curves mangled into one view graph, into one slide. Um, the, this gray line here is the copper absorption spectrum. So it's this peak, very much similar to what we've seen earlier from cobalt and iron and nickel. And now we measure the intensity of this XMCD signal while we scan the photon energy, and we see that it increases once you get closer to the copper absorption edge, and then it decreases, goes back to zero above the copper absorption edge. But what, what we found quite fascinating is that we had actually two peaks, and that's something that we did not expect. <clears throat> and now the reason why we have two peaks, uh, we ex fully expected the first peak. And the first peak sitting uh, right here at the inflection point of the copper absorption peak. And the reason why you expect a peak there is because in copper, the Fermi edge, the Fermi energy sits right here at this energy. And if you have a current, the current is carried by electrons right at the Fermi energy, right at ele electrons with essentially zero electron, uh, zero volt binding energy. And that would be exactly here. <clears throat> So, and this is where we expected that the moment gets induced right there where these, where these electrons are flowing. What we couldn't explain at the beginning is why do we see a second peak right here at the absorption peak? And to understand this a little bit better, we, we went back to, to results that uh, we had obtain, obtained quite a few years earlier, 
when we, and these cobalt domains look very similar to the cobalt domains earlier, and that's because these are very similar samples. Now what we did here is, it, it, this is just a static microscopy uh, uh, experiment. We put a little bit of copper, one nanometer of copper, on top of cobalt. And what you see is, and so these are, these are XMCD images. You see magnetic domains in the cobalt, up and down. And you see the same magnetic domains in the copper, up and down. And so you can even, uh, when you take now spectra from the cobalt and from the copper, you can even see the XMCD spectrum in the cobalt. That's, that's straightforward because it's a it's thick cobalt. But you can even extract an XMCD spectral signal from the copper. And that's due to a very small moment that gets, a fairly small moment, not actually not very small, but a fairly small moment uh, that gets induced by, into the copper at the cobalt right at the interface where these two elements are close contact. So it's, it's, it's caused by proximity uh, of the cobalt in copper. And it's typically of the order of uh, 0.01 to 0.05 Bohr magneton. Now, we did this a little bit more systematically and now we, we had uh, a bunch of different alloys between cobalt and copper. And in this case, uh, we started here with pure copper. That's 100% uh, copper concentration. And then we mixed more and more cobalt in there until we essentially reached a, a, an alloy that only had 10% copper and 90% cobalt. And what I show you here is the position of the X-ray absorption peak and also the position of the XMCD peak. That means that the, the magnetic difference. And so what you see is that these two come closer and closer together. And the reason for that is because, as I said earlier, in, in, the, in the copper spectrum, you have the Fermi edge right sitting, sitting right here on, on the inflection point. In cobalt, it would be on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the absorption resonance. And so essentially what happens, the more uh, cobalt you mix into that alloy, it drags the, the, um, the um, the energy, the binding energy of the copper D states more and more down and more and more together. And so essentially, and you end up with a situation at the end when you have very little copper dispersed in cobalt, where the copper mimics the electronic structure of the cobalt, and there you have an XMCD peak that's sitting right on the, on the X-ray absorption peak. And now, what does it mean to our experiment? Again, and this is now the spectrum rotated 90 degree. Um, these, this was the XMCD peak from the, uh, caused by the dynamic uh, moments uh, by, by, the, by the current flowing from cobalt into copper. And this apparently coincides with the energy where you would typically see these static moments. But what happens really, if you, if you don't run a current through this whole uh, stack, uh, you start with cobalt, and you, uh, you have a ferromagnetic moment in co cobalt, you have no magnetic moment in copper, and now you have these interfacial moments. So the interface is ordered, but it's not fully ordered. It's still kind of, you have to, need to have some sort of transition going from cobalt to copper. So this order will slowly decrease for the first one or two monolayers. However, once you run the current through this whole stack, first thing you do is you align the interface. And so now, essentially, you generate a magnetic moment right here at the interface, and then you get this very small moment again to the, into the rest of the copper. So that means what, what's important of, about this is that you now can understand why there's an efficiency limit with which you can inject uh, spins from, uh, from a ferromagnet into a non-magnet because you first have to, have to overcome this mixed interface that shows kind of a, that is kind of aligned but not fully aligned and you first have to align this interface before you can uh, uh, get your spin polarization into the rest of the bulk. And that can be significant because essentially, I mean, we see this peak is quite big, so it could be very well be that up to 50% uh, of this uh, spin polarization gets uh, lost right here at the interface. Okay. So, <clears throat> and that will bring, finally bring me to my third example and to the third interface. Um, so we had the ferromagnetic ferro interface, the ferromagnetic non-magnetic interface, and now we have a spin polarized current that we uh, uh, generated and transported all the way to the next ferromagnet. And so what, <coughs> <coughs> so what can happen here is then uh, also very similar to what we have heard this morning. Uh, we can actually uh, use the spin polarization or spin torque uh, right here at the interface to generate dynamics and to uh, uh, generate spin waves in that second ferromagnetic layer. Uh, by the way, so this is something that typically would not happen in a reed head or a spin valve because typically what happens then uh, for spin torque oscillators, that second layer, second ferromagnetic layer is an extended layer. So 
before I, I, come to these, uh, I come to the experiments, I want to briefly, um, I, I stole this view graph from my colleagues in Duisburg uh, who do a lot of ferromagnetic resonance, and um, I want to talk briefly about the two different geometries that you can use to image magnetization dynamics. So, and they are essentially uh, uh, borrowed from, uh, from ferromagnetic resonance here. Um, if you, when you do ferromagnetic resonance, so what you, what you would typically have, you have, a, you have a, a sample that has a certain magnetization. It's pointing this way. <coughs> now you apply a, a static magnetic field along this di uh, direction of the magnetization. And also, uh, so the, this magnetization is governed or determined by uh, lots of internal fields like the uh, anisotropy field, the exchange field, and the, and the external field, which is this one over here. Now, you would, what you will do is in FMRs, you start to excite this magnetization by applying a, um, uh, 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 an RF field perpendicular to the direction of this magnetization. And by doing so, this magnetization will start to precess. And very much like any kind of spring, if you hit the right frequency, and the, what, what the right frequency is, is given by the by the combination of external field and isotropy field and exchange field, this, one whole, this, this thing will come, uh, get into resonance. Now, what you need to do to, um, or what you can do is to measure this with x-rays, is you can do this now in two different geometries. You can either uh, come with the x-rays along the direction of the magnetization, and so what happens then is if you start with a magnetization like this, if it starts to precess, the effective component along this direction gets a little bit shorter. So this is this delta mz. So the magnetization starts to precess. It opens this precession cone. And so the effective magnetization in this direction gets a little bit shorter. And that means you can measure this, this, this shortening of the magnetization using x-rays that are coming from this side. For this purpose, you don't even need to have um, uh, a time resolution because that is, as long as this precession is going on, this uh, reduction in magnetization along this direction will appear. Um, so, but um, this, it's, it's usually a very small change in magnetization because this angle is maybe a tenth of a degree. <clears throat> Alternatively, you can come with the x-rays from the, from the perpendicular direction and really follow how the magnetization goes around, and that means uh, you, you pick up the projection of the magnetization along this axis, and so this will change positive, negative, positive, negative, and this will actually be a kind of a sizable magnetization that you can pick up there. But um, for this uh, geometry, you need uh, time resolution again. Okay, and so we will actually have two examples here for the, for the spin torque nano oscillators, and uh, e each, with a different, um, uh, each with a different geometry. So, and again, the idea here bet between the spin torque nano oscillators is that you have, you have a current source, or you, have you, have, you, have, you, are, you have a voltage source, you run a current through these ferromagnetic, non-magnet ferromagnetic stack, and when you run, the, when you run this current from, from the first ferromagnet to the second ferromagnet, now you can excite dynamics here. And the way I always compared, I compared to playing a violin because actually the current that you apply here can be a DC current. And although you apply a DC current, you suddenly have gigahertz dynamics up here. And that's pretty much what happens when you play the violin. I show here Hans Christoph Sigmund uh, when he explained how the violin worked in his, uh, in his uh, lectures. Um, it's essentially, when, you, when, you, when the bow strikes the, the, the string of the violin, essentially what happens is that uh, the very same, you have a DC excitation in the bow, and you have an AC response um, in, in, the, in the string of the violin. So, but how, what kind of response you get depends very, very much on the way you excite this, on the strength of the excitation, on the geometry of the excitation, etc. And on, apparently, I mean, you can have a very nice violin, uh, you can have very nice sound playing the violin. You can also have very bad sounds coming out of the violin. So, and this really depends on how you do it, and uh, again, on the local geometry, et cetera. And this is something that we want to then, in, again, investigate with x-rays. <clears throat> so, the first example will be the one, the longitudinal example. So, x-rays are coming from this side, uh, always along the stack. And so, we have a spin polarizing layer made from permaloy. Um, we apply a very large field to uh, uh, get the magnetization of the permaloy uh, aligned parallel to the axis. In this case, it's 700 millitesla, um, or 0.7 tesla. And then uh, the, there's a spacer layer of a little bit of copper. And then you have a cobalt nickel uh, multilayer, which is a, a perpendicular uh, magnetic anisotropy. So, and now this one starts to precess. And what we do is exactly what I, what I described earlier. For one turn of the synchrotron, we will measure, uh, we will take an image with 
um, uh, with the current applied, and for the next turn we will remove the current, and so on and so on. We do this a couple million times, and then um, look at the difference between these two. And that should show how the, where locally the magnetization gets changed by the application of this current. And so, whoop, let's see, there we go again. Not touching anything. Um, so what we found is, um, in this case, what you really see is uh, see a very nice localized excitation uh, up to, uh, starting at a certain current value. So you come in with a current for a long, long time, nothing really happens um, up to about 30 milliamps, and then once you apply 30 milliamps, and so that's 150 nanometer contact, once you apply, get to 30 milliamps, you see how the magnetization changes, starts, and this is the sign of a precession right here, uh, uh, right here at the, at the, loca at the um, location of this um, contact. And so then actually it doesn't change very much. So you get actually get to a very high, a much higher current, 34, 35 milliamps. You don't really see any change. <clears throat> the one thing that you always need to make sure and that you need to, you need to test is when you do something like this and you see a change that could be thermally induced, actually in this case, you really want to change the polarization of your X-rays from positive to negative and see if the contrast reverses. If that, if that happens, then you really know that's a magnetic contrast. And that's exactly, again, where we see like up to 34 milliamps, nothing really changes. And so our collaborators at NYU were very happy about this because from their transport measurements, they postulated that they would actually look at these kind of localized excitations um, that are referred to as magnetic solitons. And so we could really now see this and prove this with our X-ray microscopy images that this is indeed a magnetic soliton if you do a line scan through this uh, magnetic excitation, you see that uh, the, uh, the magnetization really, any kind of excitation, vanishes outside of the contact. If you would try to fit this with a, uh, with a propagating mode, uh, you would have very long tails over here, but you really don't see anything like this. So this is really an image of a magnetic soliton um, at room temperature in these uh, 150 nan nanometer contacts. So, and that brings me to the last example, now, when you rotate everything, and uh, one of the reasons why this is so easy and so nice and so straightforward is because the, the, the geometry is actually quite nice. You have all the magnetization along the axis, uh, all the stray fields, and so add up ni nicely. Now, things getting a little bit more dicey and tricky if you now use the in-plane geometry. Again, you come with x-rays from the top, uh, and now you come with x-rays from the top, and now this is the transverse geometry, so you would actually follow how the magnetization rotates around in, 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 in your plane of the sample, uh, um, in your sample. And so here the fixed layer is a cobalt iron layer. We do not need to apply a very large field, so we can just leave the magnetization in plane. Uh, we do apply a very small plane in, uh, in plane field. The contact in this case is 50 times 130 nanometers. And so the free layer that rotates is five nanometers of per, uh, permaloid. And in this case, since we're doing a time-resolved experiment, um, I just want to mention the frequency at which we observe the spin wave is 6.2 gigahertz. And so what we will do is now, in this case, we will essentially apply the current and then follow how the magnetization really rotates uh, or processes in the plane. And so what you see then is the following. This is our field of view. It's about one micrometer by one micrometer. This black uh, ellipse here um, shows where the contact is. So there's a contact, there's current coming out of the plane, a spin polarized current coming out of the plane, and you see the magnetization in the top permaloid layer. And everywhere where you have a red color, the magnetization comes out by one degree of the, of the plane. So it comes out by one degree of the plane. Everywhere there's a blue color, it goes in to the plane by one degree. <clears throat> And so what, what we found very surprising at the very beginning is that this doesn't seem to be symmetric at all. We expected something um, at least somewhat symmetric, maybe not as localized as uh, in the previous case, but it should at least be uh, symmetric with respect to the contract. But instead, we have only some actually goes up into one direction. Um, and also there's something uh, interesting, if you look at it, there's, there's, uh, it, it's not like a, 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 a simple wave shape. You can see there's a two, two times during the oscillation where there's like a note here in the, oscilla in, in, in the wave. So you have like a red and a blue part, or a blue and a red part on over here. So the whole symmetry of this excitation was kind of interesting to us again because we expected something symmetric, but it turns out at these land scales you do not see anything symmetric. And so the, the reason is, the question is, why is this the case? 
And to understand this, then we went back to the drawing board and we looked, about, we looked into what kind of fields are effective here. And uh, this brings me a little bit back to what I, uh, what, we showed, what I showed earlier, what I discussed earlier. You have to be aware of all the fields that act locally on the magnetization to understand the dynamics. So we have the, um, you have the external field, the 70 millitesla, um, and that's here in this, on the left-hand side, is uh, uh, represented by the small, short, uh, red arrows. Now you also run a current through this whole layer. So you run a current, the current comes from the cobalt iron underneath and then uh, enters the, the extended permalloy layer. So you have an Ersted field from that current. And so <clears throat> that Ersted field then uh, shows up as kind of a curly, in a curly shape around the nano contact. And you can see it a little bit here on the side. It's actually a small field, so it's hard to distinguish here. Uh, but you can see there's an arrow coming down, there's an arrow going up. So this comes from the Ersted field. But what's even more important, you have the dipolar field from the cobalt iron layer underneath, uh, which is only uh, 20 nanometers away from the permaloy layer. And that's kind of a little bar magnet, essentially. And that bar magnet produces a very strong field that, uh, uh, that comes uh, out of the plane up here and goes into the plane down here. Now, there are a lot of fields involved on this side, but um, as I said earlier, um, the, if you add up all these fields, what you can uh, deduct from this is the resonance frequency, actually the classical uh, ferromagnetic resonance frequency by adding up these different layers. And so <coughs> if you do this here on the right-hand side, you see that this resonance frequency is very much, high, is much higher than the 6.2 gigahertz on top and the bottom. And it's actually much lower than the 6.2 gigahertz uh, on, on each side of this except right down here in, in one area around the contact where you get at least close to the 6.2 gigahertz. And that's exactly the area in which the spin wave can es escape. So what this means is, and this brings me to the summary of uh, my talk and, um, uh, and also this section, what this means is essentially if you, if you now find a way to kind of control the fields around this nano contact, you could essentially uh, um, control the way a spin wave gets ejected from this nano contact. So you could either uh, have it going up or going down or going left or right. And then, um, I mean, in this, in this particular case, the spin wave doesn't get very far, only like 200, 200 or 300 nanometer. But imagine you have a material where it gets much further. So now you can actually guide it uh, into different directions, et cetera, and, and then uh, pick up the signal at a second contact that uh, acts, acts as a sensor. So again, a, a summary for this talk, um, I show these three, the two picture and the movies, um, because really what, what we have learned over the last uh, 20 years since we are doing this is that um, X-ray dichroism is a very powerful technique. Um, doing it as synchrotron has its disadvantages because you do not have a, an infinite amount of time available like you have in your lab. But if you choose your sample very well, um, you can actually then use these uh, facilities to study very particular questions and get answers that you cannot get otherwise. Um, for example, and you learn, you learn things about your samples and about your interfaces that you cannot learn otherwise. For example, for the ferromagnet, anti-ferromagnet, you learn something about the coupling between these two and what I have not shown uh, here, but you can also learn about the coupling or the, the order at the interface. <clears throat> you can learn something about the coupling uh, or the uh, spin transfer uh, between ferromagnets and uh, non-magnets and learn something about what really is the magnetization right here at the interface. And the spectroscopic signature actually tells you something about this so that you can distinguish between these two. And you, can, you, you always find surprises and you find surprises when you do these uh, spin wave experiments and you, you realize that everything is not quite as symmetric as you think and that you really have to take into account uh, all these fields uh, and that they actually do play a role uh, when looking at these kind of excitations. And with that, also oh, I think I have one more uh, slide, just uh, to acknowledge some of the collaborators and also to point uh, to uh, uh, one book in it uh, that, is, uh, that addresses many of these things uh, when you deal with synchrotron radiation and how to use synchrotron radiation in the area of magnetism by uh, uh, Joel Stirr and Hans Christoph Siegmann. Um, in, uh, uh, published by Springer. And so um, I would like to thank in particular Stefano Bonetti and Rupali Kokreja, <coughs> who uh, Rupali was a student in our group and Stefano a postdoc who uh, contributed uh, quite a bit uh, over the years and uh, were, were the driving forces behind uh, the, the time-resolved developments at the synchrotron. And our collaborators at NYU who are 
we now worked with uh, for quite a few years uh, on all these issues, and as well uh, um, the University of Duisburg, uh, who um, they are they, they are experts in, in ferromagnetic resonance and so on, and so we have a, a long-standing collaboration in this area as well. And with that, I would like to thank you. Ferromagnetic? Uh, XMLD. Uh, XMLD. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you need to talk about the uh, nature of sample that like has to be oriented or textured or uh, like epitaxial or even uh, polycrystal and sample also you can see the. Um, for the XMLD, it doesn't have to be, it can be everything. <clears throat> In polycrystalline samples, you usually run into the problem that the domains get too small. Um, so, any time you have an antiferromagnet with a uniaxial ordering, um, so then, then you can use XMLD to image it. Um, again, uh, when you do this, we tried this for a while on polycrystalline nickel oxide. Very often, then the domains get five to ten nanometers, so they are below the spatial resolution of the microscope. And um, I, I mentioned that the Tixon microscope has 15 nanometer resolution. The Stixon typically is uh, limited to 20, 25 nanometer. So that's why you can't see. It. But there's no, there's no principal reason except for spatial resolution. I think there's a. So, in an ideal antiferromagnet, we have a compensated spin. Mm -hmm. Like uh, one is cancelling an another one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, suppose now we have some inherent defects. defects, mm -hmm. And there, uh, so the com spin compensation is breaking. So, we have some uh, uncompensated moment. That's why we are getting some net ferromagnetic moment in an antiferromagnet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that sample is polycrystalline in nature. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is the possibility uh, that we can use XMLD and find out the... That, that actually, that is not a problem. Uh, so, for example, um, where did I put it there? If you look here, uh, this is, this, this, these, are, these are ferromagnetic domains in cobalt, antiferromagnetic nickel oxide, and these are actually uncompensated moments in nickel oxide, right at the interface. And that, then you, what you do is, uh, here you go to the cobalt absorption edge, you use circular polarization. Here you go to the nickel absorption edge, you use linear polarization. Now if you go to the nickel absorption edge and use circular polarization, then you see actually the, the uncompensated spins in the nickel oxide. So that, that works quite well. Okay, now if you have uh, that uncompensated moments mm -hmm. at the interface, you are talking about the interface. Suppose uh, that is there throughout the volume of the antiferromagnetic matrix. So how about that? Like how can we prove that it's not only at the interface, but it has some like 10 or 20 nanometer, uh, like even inside the antiferromagnet, like yeah. exchange bias, we generally see these yeah. things. So how about that? Like how to prove that? Like it has spread uh, at least 20 nanometer, 30 nanometer inside the antiferromagnet. Um, if you have a bulk nickel, so it, now you, I would say if you have, um, if the total thickness of the nickel oxide is, let's say, 100 nanometers, yes. then you may still be able to look through the sample with x-rays, with soft x-rays. And um, then you can, then it doesn't matter whether it's at the interface or not. Um, the only thing is, in this particular case, the way we did it here is with, uh, with PEAM, which is surface sensitive. So you really, I mean, here, yes, it's, it's about, I think it's two and a half or three nanometers of cobalt. So you really only see the surface of the, uh, of the nickel oxide because your probing depth is only five nanometer. Um, if you want to look deeper, you need to look at some photon in, photon out technique. Um, and then with soft x-rays, you end up in a situation where if your nickel oxide is thicker than 100 nanometers, it's, it's hard to look through anymore. But if, it's, if it is not much thicker than, nickel, uh, than 100 nanometers, then you could do this again. Then you would just you do, do the same experiment, but not with a PEAM microscope, but with a transmission x-ray microscope. Okay, so if, uh, no, uh, actually I have a problem there uh, in the antiferromagnet, I just want to see the uncompensated spins or the ferromagnetic moment mm -hmm. by this XMLD. So I don't have the ferromagnetic layer at all, so it can be possible there, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it, 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 again, it depends on the thickness of the, of the nickel oxide. It, it, uh, it shouldn't be too thick. Okay. <coughs> Somebody else?
If not, then it's coffee.